today. My name is Becky Spencer, and I'm in Bueller, Kansas, which is just down the road from y'all a little bit. I am a wife for about 38 years now, a mother of eight. Yes, <laughs> we have 20 grandchildren and two on the way this summer, so it's a busy, busy life. Um, we also turned our house, when all these kids left home, into a bed and breakfast. So if you ever if you get married and you need a honeymoon suite, just come see us. Um, and then here's the, here's the really amazing thing. We also um, do mission work. Oh, great. I didn't turn off my phone. <laughs> my own phone goes off in the middle of it. Oh, well. Um, ignore the, the man behind the box, okay? Behind the curtain. Um, that's so distracting. <laughs> we do mission work in Swaziland, Africa. And so four of our children are adopted. They're, they're not from there. They're domestic from the United States. But orphans are just kind of our thing. We love children mostly because we love Jesus. And I'm an ex-wannabe hippie kind of thing. And Jesus freak back in the 70s, you know, that was way. It really did happen. It wasn't just in the books. So this is a guy's t-shirt from our ministry, Grand Staff Ministries. So somebody gets that. And here's a girl's one, and somebody gets that. I have pins, but I'm afraid to throw them. Can you catch? I'm not that great of a, I'm not that great. We'll see if any of you, anybody on the softball team? Ugh. I'm really bad, so nobody in the back got anything. But we're going to talk a little bit this morning about that verse from John 14. Let me see if we got it on here. Okay. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And Jesus was actually talking to his disciples when he said this, letting them know that he was getting ready to leave, but it wasn't going to mean they would be alone. He was still going to be with them, just in a different form. And actually, it was going to be better for them when he left, because he would not just be with them physically, but he would actually live inside of them, so that he would never, ever, ever be apart from them. And yet, a lot of times, this scripture is used when we're working with orphans. There's a good reason for that. Jesus knew what it was like to be separated from his father. He left the father on purpose for us. Left the comfort of the father. Left the love of the father. And had to experience him in a different way. Now we know the father was still with him. But it was a different kind of relationship. So Jesus knew what it was like to have that separation. And yet the spirit of adoption is such a huge thing. We read the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1. And do you realize that that was actually Joseph's genealogy? It wasn't the birth genealogy of Jesus through Mary. It was his adoptive dad. So here he has left heaven, left his true father, and has a heritage through the spirit of adoption. Huge. Can you hear me? What's happening? Oh, sorry. Okay, we'll do that. That's all right. Modern technology. <laughs> Jesus didn't have Okay, now is this going to work? Is that better? Okay, good. Oh, thank you. That is better. I like that. Okay, yay. <laughs> now you can get your surveys back, right? <laughs> if there's a problem, they fix it. So that's good. But Jesus actually um, understood so much what it was like to need the presence of a father. So when we're working with orphans, it's just a huge thing to use this scripture. Because God's desire is that no one would be fatherless. God, there's a lot of ways to describe the, the Lord God. But the best description is father. It's father. And I know in a group this size, there are people here who have experienced fatherlessness. And you know the ache and the hole that it leaves. Yet God's desire is to come to us, to fill that hurt, to heal the wound. So I can't, there's not time for me to go into the whole story about how we ended up in Swaziland, Africa. I really never considered myself Africa material at all. But, not at all. <laughs> but you just never know. When God calls you to something, it is an absolute delight. What I'm going to talk to you about today, let me see if I get this to go. Oh, you have to turn it on. <laughs> is that there is a job description waiting for you. Oh, now it's even better, good. 
want ads construction workers sought, and there is no experience needed. It's extremely low pay. In fact, you have to provide your own support and your own tools. But the retirement benefits are out of this world. And I know that there are some of you who are graduating right now. Some of you are getting ready to embark on your own career. But this morning, what I want to talk to you about is that there is a job for you to do as a builder, no matter what field you're in. And it truly is a time to build for Grand Staff Ministries. King Solomon wisely said that there's a time to tear down and a time to build. And sometimes when you get involved in ministry, which some of you are going to find out if you haven't already, there are ways of doing things that really do have to be torn down before you can do a really excellent job. And that's where we have found ourselves as a ministry. We, we started in 2006, and we find sponsors for individual orphans. And so we went into Swaziland and found out some ways worked, some didn't, so we had to tear some things down, and now we're in this building phase. We're going to look at several things this morning. Uh, we have time. And it, I'm really going to ask four questions from the scriptures we look at. One is, are we building? The next one is, why are we building? Then, what are we building? And finally, how are we building? During this uh, particular time when Zechariah was walking the earth, Israel had been captive for 70 years. And you guys know the pattern if, you, if you've read your Bible, Old Testament at all. They would love God and serve him, and then they would get involved with the idols of whatever country they were around and the nations of the, other, the rest of the world, all the ites. And so God would have to judge them. And, this, and then they would repent, and it was just back and forth, just a continual pattern of sin and then coming back to God and going right back into it. And finally, God had to let the Babylonians take them captive for 70 years. So they have just come back into their own land, the promised land, and their job is to build the temple, get it rebuilt. It was utterly destroyed. They were supposed to rebuild it. Well, they got started, but they quit before it was done. So God sent two prophets at the same time. One was Zechariah, the other one was Haggai. And these men came with a message for them. And actually, uh, I'm not going to read all these scriptures, I'm just going to kind of skip ahead. But there were these uh, angels in these trees, and the angel of the Lord, capital A, which we know as the pre-incarnate Christ, were standing there. And they were basically given the job by Jesus to go out and look at all the earth. And what they came back to report was this. We have walked to and fro throughout the earth, and behold, the earth is resting quietly. Jesus, as the angel of the Lord, said, How long will you have mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you were angry these 70 years? It's like, okay, God was angry. He let them be taken captive. They're back now, and all the earth is at rest. And it's like, God, how long are you going to keep being patient? Or how long are you going to be angry with them because of the situation here? The Lord said, I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease. God was not just a little bit miffed. He was not just perturbed. He was exceedingly angry with the nations who were at ease. He expects us to be doing something. He expects us to be building. So the very first thing is, are we building? He wants us to in the kingdom. The next one, and, and look, we love a peaceful life, okay? Don't you like it when everything's going smoothly? It isn't like we're looking for more to do. It's a busy society we live in. But if we are not engaged in what God wants to accomplish, he isn't pleased. He doesn't want us just to fill our time with activities that are all about us. And that really takes us into the next one, because we all have a job to do in this kingdom, and he has plans to reach those needy. So are we building as anything constructive for the kingdom taking place? So the next one is, why are we building? And here it is, the angel of the Lord said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Jerusalem and for, okay, the scripture already read, Zion with great zeal. I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease, for I was a little angry, and they helped, but with evil intent. So the next one is, why are we building? God finally got them stirred up to do something, 
but they didn't do it for the right reasons. They did it with evil intent. And you know, we have to ask ourselves, what motivates us to pitch in when there's work to be done for the kingdom? What is the motivating force behind it? Is it guilt? Is it fear? Is it kind of a greedy, self-centered thing? What's in it for me? Is it peer pressure? Is it pride? None of those things are beneficial to us and certainly not a good way or reason to be building. When we give our lives to him, he wants to make something beautiful from them because he also is a master builder. But it's the pure heart, the pure heart, doing it for the right reasons, loving him and loving people, motivated by love. And we can't help everyone. We could run around trying to get involved in every single thing that there is to do. And we can't, can we? Especially when you get old like me. <laughs> we have to know what is God saying? What is, what, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? And I'll focus there. Okay, so that's what Zechariah was saying to them. Uh, are you even engaged in building something e eternal? And next, why are you doing it? Let's get our motives right. Then here comes Haggai. And what had happened was the people quit building the temple and started building their own houses. And that wasn't okay. It was totally not okay. So thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying that this people says, the time has not come, the time the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai, saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to be put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. He's saying, you're building your own thing and it's leaving you unsatisfied. And don't all of us know someone who is working so hard, making a lot of money, building a bigger house, a bigger house, a better car, on and on and on, and yet there's no satisfaction. And we also look at this world right now where there is so much drought. I mean, we prayed about it this morning. There's so much drought, earthquakes, tornadoes, tsunamis, just the whole earth in uproar. Is it possible that it is God's response to what is happening on the earth today, that people in general are only concerned with self, building their own kingdom instead of the kingdom of God. Is it possible that that is why we are not seeing the fruitfulness? So God says, you looked for much, but indeed it came too little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house, that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. God is watching even today. He looks to see what we're building. The thing is, when the Israelites rebuilt the temple, y'all, they weren't just building a building. They were building a future with God. That temple represented their relationship with him and their willingness to love him and obey him and walk in his ways. So when God called them to rebuild the temple, it wasn't just about the structure. It represented something between them. They were building a future with God. If we are building something that is just wood and steel or mud and grass, as in the case in Swaziland, then it's only as valuable as the longevity of the materials. But if it's filled with God's purposes, it will live way beyond the matter that it's made with and even beyond the lives of the people who built it. It will be something eternal. We're going to go to that fourth point in just a minute. But first, I just want to quickly show you what we're building in Swaziland. And a quick little look here first. Oops, sorry. This is Africa, and way down in the bottom is South Africa. And you'll notice a little dot there that is Swaziland, almost completely surrounded by South Africa. 
Here, and here, here's an up-close picture of it. It's about a million people, and the experts estimate half of the population has AIDS. They have the highest incidence of AIDS in the world. So, of course, there are many, many, oh, that's the king. They're the last kingdom, also, that's a complete monarchy, not even recognized as a country by the uh, nations of the world. I can't think of what it's called. Um, lots of traditional things like the witch doctors, worship of ancestors, and so on. Even the king claims to be a Christian, but he still worships the ancestors and chooses a new bride from this horrible festival with young girls. Um, the traditions, old traditions and modern world clashing many times, but all the AIDS leaves many, many, many hurting and sick children and, like I said, gobs of orphans. This was a family of nine children being raised by the sister because the parents were gone, and so was the grandma. Many of the go-go's, the grandmas, feel like life has played a dirty trick on them because they expected to be cared for in their old age, and instead they're having all these children brought to their homestead, and they can't even feed them. Um, we, we do participate in some feeding programs. We've provided food for a lot of kids, which is so satisfying. You gotta eat to be able to hear. And we also then, in January, sent 92 children to school. Most countries in Africa, you have to pay tuition and have a uniform, so obviously orphans can't provide that for themselves. So we now have 92 kids that, that we have in school. We're so excited about that. Um, this is the schoolyard and one of the classrooms here. Um, we did a big book bag, book, bag, book bag project, there we go. In January, I took 100 book bags to kids and, and then filled them with supplies when we were there. It was so much fun. Uh, one, one of the boys that, that we are working with for the, about the last three years is doing great in school, and his report card is just filled with excellent, 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 excellent. Well, we, we found another, oh, it didn't show it. Uh, oh, I didn't put it in there, but there's another boy who was at fourth in his class out of 37 and we got real excited until we found out that he was almost failing all of his classes. I'm going, okay, he's fourth in his class and failing. What does the report card look like for the 37th? So when I was there in January, I started visiting these schools and I'm a former teacher and I was appalled at the quality of education most of these kids are getting or not getting, I guess I should say. So I came back and talked to my board and we've decided that we're going to build a school. And so we can, we're going to be able to have 80 children in this school. It's going to take about $40,000 to build it and finish it out. We're really, really excited about that. But I'm showing you pictures here of one of the, the places. It's called a squatter's camp where many of the kids live. And before we can even get to the school, we've got to do something else. Because this is a, a really dangerous place to live. Lots of unemployment, lots of poverty. It's people who have no land and they've just basically come and squatted and built whatever they could build if there was space. This little, oh, the, the little girl that lived in this structure is the one I'm gonna to talk to you about very briefly. Her name is Angel. My daughter, Sarah, is her sponsor and got to meet her in 2012. She was in third grade then and we found out that her mother was locking her out of that little house at night in the squatter's camp where there are men who are drinking all this unemployment, atrocious conditions. Can you imagine what a third grader could have done to get locked out of the house? Nothing. It's pure evil, pure evil. And the thing that worried us the most was that, oh, they were inseparable. <laughs> when I saw her Angel in July of 2013, she looked like that side. When I saw her again, when I was just there, she looked like the other side, and there, had, there was a huge change in her. You may not be able to see it from the picture, but I could see it in her, this seductiveness about her. And we, we really believe from some of the information we got that her mother is prostituting her at night. Her mother does not want her, and we've been trying for two years to find an orphan home for her, an orphanage. There is nothing available because there are so many orphans. The few beds that are available are such horrible living conditions, we wouldn't put anyone there, much less this precious girl that we love so much. So my board said, you know what? If we can't find her one, let's build her one. So before we build the school, we're building our first orphan home, and it will house eight to 12 children in it. I'm so excited, I can barely stand it. Eight to 12 children, and, the, and we looked at different models. This one is going to have house parents who are right there loving these kids, teaching them his ways, helping them know. 
what life is really all about. And Pastor Sambo is the one we'll be working with for that awesome man of God. The man on the left, or on your right, is uh, the missionary we work with there. Trying to. Okay, I'm going to have to just get on through this fast. The last thing is how are we building? And y'all know the story. The wise man built his house on a rock. When the storms of life came, it stood. The foolish man built it on the sand, and when the storms of life came, it was wiped out. Nothing in scripture tells us whether these men had a difference in their ability to build. They might have both been master builders. The thing that made the difference was what they built on. What was the foundation? It doesn't matter how skilled or talented or smart or great we are or think we are. That won't stand. How we build on that rock is the most important part of it. That's why people like me who really aren't that big of a deal are able to get a lot done in the kingdom because it isn't about what I can or can't do. God calls you to stuff that's so much bigger than you. He does it over and over because he wants to get the glory. He wants it to be something that you could never do. And I love that because then even, even just regular old people, moms in Bueller, Kansas, Grammys, can get to do something eternal, and it's amazing. So y'all, let's just look back over it. Are we building? Why are we building? What are we building? And how are we building? And as you are going out, you're finishing your school year, you're looking ahead, I want you to know that God will not abandon you either. You're at a scary place right now, some of you. Even the summer plans might look scary. God is not going to abandon you. He is not going to leave you as an orphan. When you leave all these people you've become so close to and the teachers and all, he's not going to abandon you. He has a huge, huge, huge plan for you and a call so that no matter whether you are pastors or worship leaders or businessmen and women or teachers or whatever it is he's called you to do, you still have a job to be a builder in this kingdom. Should I just close? Are we, are we late? Or should, are we going to have time for a song? I think we're... I think, okay, sorry, <laughs> we started late. <laughs> um, here's what I want to say to you as you go. God has plans. We are actually taking a trip to Swaziland this summer. We still have about six spots left on it. If you feel like God is calling you, get one of our information packets, okay? If you just want to know more about our ministry, grab a card. But there's always room for what you have to offer. I mean, ministries need videos. They need volunteers. They need workers. No matter what you're doing, you can do that. But I want to send you out this morning with just a blessing and a prayer, a benediction of sorts. And I'm just going to pray that over you as you were dismissed. And thank you so much for letting me come and share my heart. But Lord God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that each one of these students and faculty will be in the right place at the right time with the right people doing the right things for the right reasons. And I commission you to go out from here when you leave school this year and build what God has called you to build. Write songs to further the kingdom. Preach sermons to build the kingdom and live a life that is always building the kingdom in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.